Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Thursday, December 5th, 2019. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's get right into it today. Out of the Times of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu says, Iran's empire is tottering. Let's make it totter even further. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called for increased action against Iran, indicating that the recent unrest in the Islamic Republic offers an opportunity, opportunity to bring down the regime. Bring down the regime. He said Iran is increasing its aggression as we speak, even today in the region. They're trying to have staging grounds against us and the region, from Iran itself, from Iraq, from Syria, from Lebanon, Gaza, and Yemen. We are actively engaged in countering that aggression. These are a lot of the areas we hear about in Scripture. These countries, these nations that come against Israel in Ezekiel 38, uh, Psalm 83, several other places. Out of the Times of Israel, airstrikes target Iranian weapons stores in eastern Syria. Unidentified aircraft bomb warehouses at airport near Iraqi border. These were Iranian-controlled weapons storehouses. Tell me this, why does Iran need weapons stored in eastern Syria close to Israel? Huh. Yeah, because they fully intend at some point to try to wipe Israel off the map. So many people fail to realize. God tells us this in here. So if you don't know it, then either you haven't read God's word or you don't believe God's word. Just saying, so many people fail to recognize this. Out of MSN, Iran is secretly moving missiles into Iraq, U.S. officials say. Iran has used the continuing chaos in Iraq to build up a hidden arsenal of short-range ballistic missiles in Iraq, part of a widening effort to try to intimidate the Middle East and assert its power according to American intelligence and military officials. Okay, I am not an FBI guy. I am not CIA. I'm not any part of American intelligence, but I can tell you this. Iran will attack in the Middle East. Okay? Just want you to understand that. Uh, because this next story says, out of the Times of Israel, Pentagon says, signs suggest Iran may be preparing attack in the region. <laughs> really? You needed the Pentagon to tell you that? Because, again, this right here tells you all about it. Read it. I don't need the Pentagon, the FBI, Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. I don't need any of these guys to tell me that Iran's going to attack because I already know they are. It's in God's Word. So it's going to happen. Out of the Times of Israel, Pentagon denies U.S. mauling sending 14,000 troops to Mideast as Iran threat grows. You think they denied this because they really sent them? They just don't want Iran to know it? I think, I think Trump is sending all kinds of troops to the Middle East in preparation for Iran. Just saying. Moving on. Out of the Times of Israel, Lieberman says elections are unavoidable. Neither a narrow government nor a unity government is an option at this time. So it looks like, yes, February 25th. Let's see, is that still the date they're looking at um, for a new election? I think that was the date I read about yesterday. Now that could change day to day, but that was the last I saw. Uh, scanning through this article, I don't see a date. Yep, February 25th, 2020 will be their third election. Unless, for some reason, they can somehow form an acceptable government between now and then. Out of Israel, Hayom, report says Hamas calls for resumption of Gaza border violence. The terrorist group that controls the coastal enclave urges masses to resume Mass Friday protests near the Israel-Gaza security fence following a three-week hiatus. Yeah, go throw some rocks and bombs, because, you know, it always gets them some results, right? 
Out of Israel National News, 50% increase in building permits in Samaria. Wow. 50% increase in building permits in Samaria. The Real Estate Conference in Elat for the first time today held a panel on opportunities in Judea and Samaria, which included Samarian Regional Council Chairman and others, uh, several bigwigs there, saying there's change in Judea and Samaria and the understanding by more and more investors that Samaria is not the next thing but the current thing. Number of building permits has risen significantly in recent years by 50%. I've been in Samaria, I've been in Judea, wouldn't mind living there, actually. In fact, at some point in my life, I would really love to live in Israel. We need, you know what, to live each day as if it were our last. Let's get right into the word in Titus. Titus 2, starting in verse 12. It says, for the grace, no, uh, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I once heard that someone asked the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody, how he would spend the day if he knew it was his last one. And he said he wouldn't do anything differently than he did every day. That's pretty amazing. You know, that's the way we should all live as Christians. Uh, we can find all kinds of things in the Bible about the return of Christ. In fact, in the 260 chapters in the New Testament, Christ's return is mentioned some 318 times. 318 times. Statistically, that would be one out of every 25 verses in the Bible mentions the return of Jesus Christ. So, just to make a point, let's, let's say that we knew that Jesus Christ was returning at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. I'm sure we would all look like saints at 2.45, right? We'd be wearing our Sunday morning smiles, clean shirts, you know, brushed teeth, combed hair, our come quickly Lord Jesus attitudes. Now, don't get me wrong, we know this isn't possible because no one knows the day or the hour. I mean, Jesus said of his return, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows, Matthew 24, 36. But the fact is, we ought to live this way every single day, as if Jesus could return any minute. You know what? If you think about it, we have never been closer to the Lord's return than we are right now this minute. We've never been closer than right now. The Bible says you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. A thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really slack concerning his promise, as some people count slackness, but he's patient for your sake. He doesn't want any to be destroyed, but wants all to come to repentance. God doesn't want any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. So we should live every day as though it were the day that Christ is coming back. We should try to live every day as if it were our last. How many of you would forgive others that have done you wrong or try to make amends to those that maybe you've done wrong to? Or how would you love more thinking it might be your last day? What words might you speak to someone thinking it might be the last time you speak to them. We need to cherish every moment we have. The Bible tells us life is but a mist, a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. If you go to a cemetery, you look on the tombstones, you'll see a date of birth and a little dash and the date of death. And that little dash represents your entire life. Little dash, it's like a short race. Are you running it to the fullest? Or you stop, and take a break, play some video games, get on your phone, waste some time. Life is short. Do all you can while you can, because no one is promised tomorrow. You know, 
believing in God won't save you. In James 2, verse 19, it tells us, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You believe that God is one. Well, good. Even the demons believe and they tremble. I had a conversation with a person one time. I can't even remember where we were, but I remember the conversation. And I, as we talked, I asked this lady, she was a, an older lady. Um, this must have been, I don't know, 20 years ago or more. And she was probably in her 70s. And I asked her, well, where do you go to church? And she said, oh, I, I used to go, but I don't anymore. So this was one of the times that I, I said, well, you know, Jesus died on a cross to save you, and he loves you, and he wants to have fellowship with you. And I shared more and more of the gospel with her, and she said, you know what? I went to church for years, and I never once heard that. She said, I believed in God, but I never knew Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I think that very same thing is, is playing out in the lives of so many people today. So many people. Um, just so you know and understand something here, believing in God won't save you. It won't save you. Um, this verse I just read tells us that demons believe, yet they're not saved. They're demons. What saves you is a, a personal faith in Jesus Christ, that he died on your behalf, that he rose again from the dead just like he said he would. And by faith in him, you can have everlasting life. Christ is the only one who can save you. He said so himself in John 14, 6. So if there's any doubt in your mind today, you need to put your faith fully in Jesus Christ, in what he did on the cross as being the only thing necessary for your salvations. Good works won't save you. Going to church won't save you. Belief in God won't save you. Uh, the president of the United States won't save you. The prime minister of Israel won't save you. The pope won't save you. Muhammad can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. He's the only way, the truth and the life, and the only way to God the Father. So put your faith in Christ today and Christ alone because there is no salvation in any other name under heaven. We have to trust God's ordained authority. If you read in 1 Samuel 15, uh, about verses 1 through 23, you read about Saul, one of the first kings of Israel. Now, not the Saul that became the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, but Saul that actually tried to kill David, who later became king. You know, God has our best interest in mind. He plans for each believer. He has plans for each believer. And they're meant to bring fullness of life and to bring him glory. But he didn't create us to be robots. He didn't program us to just blindly follow him no matter what. God gives us free choice, free will. We can choose whether or not to obey him, whether or not to follow Christ or deny him. Your choice, I would say choose wisely, because one path leads to everlasting death and the other leads to everlasting life. Our human nature tends to choose a very self-centered path that turns away from God's authority. We want to do it our way, right? And in doing so, we miss God's best for our life. Think about Saul. I mean, God chose this man to be king and he provided laws and commandments and guidelines for him to follow. And even though Saul knew the Lord's instruction, he chose to do things his own way. There were times his sin was probably deliberate, like his attempt to kill David out of jealousy. He was jealous. Other times his rebellion seemed uh, maybe not quite so clear cut. I mean, think about it. Even though God ordered him to utterly destroy the Amalekites and their animals, Saul spared the best of the herd with the, the justification that he intended to sacrifice them to the Lord. It's in 1 Samuel 15, 3. And 1 Samuel 15, verse 21. Yeah. Um, the choice to disobey 
actually cost Saul the throne, and it eventually led to his destruction because he disobeyed God deliberately. He chose the road that he thought was best, even though God told him. And we know now the end result wasn't worth it, was it? He should have listened to God. But you can't help but think God had a plan for David too. And in order for God's plan for David to come to fruition, Saul had to choose the path that he chose. And sometimes it just boggles the mind. Yes, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what you're going to do. He knows what you're going to choose. But we still have the ability to choose. We can learn a lot from his mistakes. I mean, partial obedience is actually disobedience. And any disobedience falls in the category of rebellion, which is sin. And even though our circumstances might be incredibly different from Saul's, we face the same type of choices each and every day. We're just as vulnerable to this lure of temptation. But if we choose to live God's way, the Holy Spirit will help us. He'll lead us and guide us. And if we listen for his voice, he'll help us to make the right choices. And then we will find fullness in life that will bring glory to God. You know, you keep hearing this word unity, especially in Israel's government right now. They're, they're like, we need a unity government. We need to all be on the same page. We need to be together. One in spirit. Jesus said, John 17, 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know, Jesus is praying here, probably with the greatest prayers found in John 17. Jesus is praying for all believers to be one as he and the Father are one. This goes far beyond what anyone might promote as unity today. I mean, Paul was telling the Corinthians to all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. This is God's standard of unity, that we all be of one mind, that we have the mind of Christ. The oneness among believers is what Jesus said would cause the world to know that Jesus is the Son of God. It's the greatest tool for evangelism that we have today. The only way that Christ's body will be one as the Father and Jesus are one is through God's kind of love, agape love. I mean, no wonder the devil tries to get believers uh, to argue with each other, to, to get us at each other's throats, arguing about things that we really shouldn't be arguing about. You know, the, the timing of the rapture or, you know, what the tribulation is or who this is or what this represents. That's not what we need to be discussing. We need to be talking about how Jesus is the only way to God the Father. That Jesus is the only one that can save you. The good news of the gospel must go out throughout the world, and then the end will come. Jesus said in John 24, 14, sharing the gospel. You know, we spend billions of dollars a year on evangelism through television and radio and conventions and crusades, yet the world isn't evangelized because the body of Christ is not united in love. There's very little unity among believers today. Don't believe me? Look online. Go to some uh, big name evangelist channel. Look online. Well, look at where how they argue. Oh, this isn't true. You're speaking from something that's not in the Bible. Oh, well, here's what the Bible says. People will take a, a Bible verse and, and twist it to kind of promote their agenda and, and try to make it say what it doesn't say. Happens all over the place. I see it daily. People will send me a verse and go, this is telling me that and I'm like, that, that's not at all what that verse is saying. How do you arrive at that conclusion? And I, I don't have anything to do with foolish arguments. So there's a lot of times I won't even respond when somebody is clearly just trying to provoke me. Um, this has happened over thousands of years. It won't be fixed overnight. We have to strive towards unity, but not be overwhelmed by the problem. You know, the devil brings division. Actually, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but division. The division that Jesus brings is that you're either for him or against him. Jesus draws a line in the sand. 
You're either on the right or the left. The right are the sheep that inherit the kingdom of God. The left are the goats that inherit eternal damnation. Interesting that today in America, we have those on the right and those on the left. Huh. God does know the end from the beginning. God says those on his right inherit the kingdom. Those on the left, eternal damnation. Matthew 25, read all about it. In fact, God tells us in Ecclesiastes 10 too that the fool's heart is at his left hand. <laughs> Just saying, the wise man's heart at his right. All Christians have already been joined together to each other through the body of Christ, and God the Father sees us as his children. All divisions among Christians are made by man, not by God. There was a brief period of time that the church enjoyed unity on earth. But no matter what kind of troubles and division has occurred, all believers are still one in Christ and will live in perfect oneness throughout eternity with Christ. We're now one in spirit. We just need to experience that unity here on earth in the flesh. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.